Welcome to the Dream Life is Real Life podcast. I'm your host, Hannah Hermanson. I know it might seem cheesy or cliche, but if you've got a sleeping giant inside of you, or you just feel like you're made for more, then there's no coincidence you landed here on the Dream Life is Real Life podcast. Listen, as a girl from small town Wisconsin who decided to go all in to her dream life vision, I know how crazy it can feel to chase after wild ideas. Since leaving my nine to five job in academics back in 2015 to becoming a yoga teacher, a life coach, and now a digital nomad currently living in Merida, Mexico with my husband and Labradoodle, I know that all the cheesy cliches are true. I've watched a lot of my dream life become my real life right in front of my eyes. Oh, and I've learned a whole lot about sales, business, and marketing along the way. And I want to share all of that with you. So here you can consider me your friend and mentor as a certified business coach, success trainer, international speaker, author, and copywriter. I've helped hundreds of coaches, and entrepreneurs build, scale, and enjoy their online businesses. So here on the show, you'll find the real people, concrete tactics, and weekly motivation and inspiration to make your dream life your real life. I'm going to let you into the nooks and crannies of these dream lives and dream businesses and offer lots of real talk along the way. Because to be a true leader in whatever you're endeavoring in your life and to create a legacy that you're proud of, you need a tribe lifting you up with you on the journey. And I've made it my mission to be that partner with you. Because after all, we are all in this together. By the way, if you'd like some help improving your business and life, then we just might be able to help. Head on over to dreamlifeisraelite.com to learn more about what we do and how I might be able to personally support you and just continue this conversation in making your dream life your real life. All right, let's get to it. Hey, hey, today we are with Kaylee Adams, who is the founder and creative director of Wilds District, a NYC-based design studio that specializes in emerging women's and e-commerce brands. Wilds District works closely with founders to build meaningful experiences that span multiple touch points, including brand, web, app, print, packaging, and beyond. Kaylee has over a decade of design experience with working with some brands you may have heard of, like Chanel, The Row, Rolex, War- Warby Parker, Ralph Lauren, we could go on and on. But after spending years building larger brands, she turned her focus to working with early stage companies to help them navigate the many phases and challenges of brand development from pre-launch to post-launch life <laughs> and created Wild District in 2017. Today, she leads the Wilds District team and partners with founders to help them build their brands from the ground up with visually compelling but scalable design. We have so much in common besides working for Ralph Lauren. Welcome. Hi, <laughs> I love thank this. you so much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. And when I say so much in common, I think the way that we think about business and launching as something bigger than just a throw spaghetti on the refrigerator and like hope we build one funnel for our whole life and it's all just going to like be magical. I love how you break down all of the elements and think about not just the launch, but pre and post launch life. I love yes. that. Yeah. It's, it's definitely kind of a, a, a complex process whenever you're launching a new brand. And I think it's kind of, it's been an interesting journey for me because I think that process alone has, is something that most people go through maybe once or twice in their lives. But coming from the creative side and helping so many of these uh, brands launch over time, I've seen a lot. And in aggregate, it kind of paints a really interesting picture about all the things you need to pay attention to when you're building a business, when you're launching. And um, I just find it really interesting to be able to, you know, work with people from the beginning and then also follow up with them as the years go on, see how things are doing. And really, I think... um, where our sweet spot is as a company is to provide really beautiful and premium looking designs that also just perform. Um, We're always keeping performance in mind in terms of 
um, making sure that websites convert and your paid advertising, um, the photography is really kind of doing it the most it can for you on your social and your paid advertising channels. So, um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of complexity in the build, brand building process. And I, I, I like that you mentioned that kind of before and after, because it is it is more than just kind of um, creating the brand in the beginning. You really want to build something that works, not just looks good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we can dive into more of those specifics around building the brand and what is necessarily necessary and what is shiny object because I think there's some a lot of confusion about those elements but I first want to ask a more personal question because I think it's really interesting you went from big corporations famous brands to then working with female entrepreneurs I mean you could have gone anywhere (laughs) you could could probably you know just kind of hand choose who you want to work with so why why female entrepreneurs Um, really for me, it was about, uh, kind of connecting with people that are like-minded. I mean, just, I guess, backing up a a little bit, starting my own studio and becoming a a founder, it definitely is challenging. I think in women face even more hurdles and challenges as they grow and build businesses. And it was something that I very, really, you know, wanted to focus on and support and, Very early on, I started realizing I was working at a lot of agencies um, in New York and they're kind of famous. I don't know if you've ever seen Mad Men, but it's kind of um, (laughs) it's it's kind of sadly close to what it used to be, that that industry. And it's very male dominated. It's very um, kind of an aggressive industry to be in. It's a lot of women just burn out and um, it's it's kind of a a harder long term um, uh, career to make. And so when I was working in these um, agencies early on in New York, it was very much like a work all the time, crazy. But I noticed at a certain point that I was the only female on the team, um, especially within design. You know, I think maybe there was one um, female that I worked with that was a, a project manager, but that was about it. And, um, you know, I think it struck me as odd because we were working for very premium projects. We were, you um, you know, working for Chanel, like you mentioned. And um, it just seemed odd to me that all of our meetings, when we took meetings with the clients, they were all women teams, um, you know, building these massive brands. And then here we were, an all male team and me. (laughs) And, um, you know, I definitely felt in the early days too, especially when I was a very junior designer, I would kind of get dragged around um, to high profile meetings I probably shouldn't have been in um, only because I was kind of the token woman on the team. Um, (laughs) And so that's kind of, it struck me as odd. And I also just thought that like, you know, women as consumers, um, we really are super discerning. And, you know, that's why a lot of women run these big brands is because like they get their audience, they get their consumer. And so why shouldn't your design studio be the same Mm. um, way? And so there's a stat out there that's pretty abysmal about, Um, female ownership of studios and agencies. It's just comically low. And so what I realized is like, after a number of years working in the industry, I really decided that I wanted to focus on um, building products and experiences for women's brands. And oftentimes that kind of goes hand in hand with with female founders. So um, that was the goal, I think. It was kind of just through experience and seeing how, you know, um, it kind of was an unmet need at the time, um, especially when I started Wilds District a a few years ago. Yeah. And okay, you're really on the cusp of a bigger evolution. So I don't know how woo-woo you are, but I'm a little woo-woo, becoming more and more woo-woo every day, (laughs) I think. And I've been really studying marketing trends, of course. But what we have to understand about marketing or building a brand or any business is that it lives within a larger context of culture. And how people are working and living. I mean, 2020 gave us a big opportunity to shift culture to Zoom. <laughs> and so businesses started to figure that out. And marketing had to figure out how to play a game, you know, a bigger game online. So what I'm getting at here is that your journey is reflecting this shift that we're seeing at a bigger level from masculine ways of doing things. Like you said, go for the jugular, intense, competitive, be the best, climb the ladder, 
kind of scare people into working with you or use some of those more um, go for the jugular types of marketing tactics to the future, which is feminine in a lot of ways. What I mean by feminine is thinking about, yes, more female leaders and brands, but also thinking about building things that are about connection, community, collaboration, sharing of power. And I think personal brands who can leverage that are set up for a lot of success moving forward. Are you sensing that in some of the, I mean, you work with female entrepreneurs. So are you feeling that focus on connection becoming really important? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, that's a really interesting point because I think that with connection, a lot of, so a lot of brands that we've been launching in the past five years have been really um, kind of strong brand brands, I guess. They're very, they come out with very distinct look and feels. They target very specific communities, but as such, they've been able to be more successful because people see them and identify with them. So they're able to feel pulled in, like they're part of that community very early on. And I think for a large swath of other brands out there, the the typical playbook, at least in the last couple of years, has just been like churn out a bunch of Instagram ads and um, just acquire customers. But really that doesn't set people up for a long-term growth just because it's just your churn rate at a certain point, your, your, your cost of customer acquisition is going to be so high. Um, you just are going to need no to get- control. Like I've yeah. been <laughs> in an Instagram prison before where they're just like, Oh, yeah. randomly in timeout. And that's your only source of like branding <laughs> generation sales. Yeah. Like how do you Very. sleep at night? Honestly, <laughs> yeah. you don't want to no. become over reliant on that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> for those reasons. And, um, You know, I think women in particular are drawn to communities uh, as well. And so I think that's the difference between um, working with a a woman-led studio or people, you know, people like us that focus with women um, founders is that I think there's kind of a a thing that's hard to to name or quantify that's really, um, I think we're we're all drawn to kind of like community-based brands. We want to feel a part of the things that we purchase um, and it's a lot less transactional. And so that plays a really big role in brand. And I think that to your point, like people just want to feel connected in any way, whether that be to other people or other um, consumers that are buying the same brand or to the brand itself. And um, that's been a huge shift um, recently, I think. And I've seen a lot of our clients really push toward building strong micro communities in the beginning. And those people end up really being the ones to evangelize the brand moving forward. Mm-hmm. I feel like I, I stumbled into this knowing it was so ad hoc for me, like 2016, I didn't even have Facebook. And I was like, I'm going to join Facebook and start a group and start talking about what I want to talk about just because it was like free and I could. But I think if we as female entrepreneurs can get some strategy from the beginning and then this like launch phase, that opportunity to become that thought leader, to be that trailblazer um, is even more available. So talk to us about how specifically you work with female entrepreneurs and even what this, this, you know, the steps look like to strategically relaunch or introduce a new brand. Mm -hmm. We, um, we, we do a lot of process in the beginning and upfront when we work with anybody new, we really do a period of discovery and deep dive into their ethos and what makes them their brand unique. Um, and ultimately those are the pillars that end up building really powerful brands. So we work um, very closely with that and we keep that in mind throughout the whole process. So, I mean, we do an, a, a lot of different work. So we'll do work um, in branding, we'll do work in digital, you know, be it websites or app building. Um, we do collateral print and event design. Um, so I think that um, early on identifying your purpose and what makes you unique and special as a brand really just for us drives the rest of the design process. And so We do a lot of kind of early iterative meetings where we're very collaborative. We'll do mood board sessions. We'll kind of talk to the founders about why they they started the brand in the first place, which is, you know, there's a lot of heart in those stories often that can get translated into the brand itself. 
Um, and so the process is really kind of exploratory in the beginning. And then what we do is we work with the founders directly because they're obviously the ones who know their brand the, the most um, to build and scale f- from there. So, you know, people come to us for um, launching new sites or relaunching their existing sites and kind of the full gamut. And so we try to make sure that um, you know, regardless of what the project is, we're understanding not only the brand, but their ethos and their community behind it. Um, and working with female entrepreneurs is fun as well, because it's just, I mentioned collaboration, but it just, we, it's like, you kind of, you kind of get each other, like, you know, it doesn't mean that we're all like hanging out and you know, brushing each other's hair or whatever, but like, it just feels like very empowering to be in a room with other women that are building big things and have ambitions and goals. And that's really inspiring. And it fuels me personally quite a bit as well. So um, I think that that's, that's my connection piece, really. It's exactly, different. exactly. Yeah. When you find someone that you really respect too, then that's the thing. I think a lot of these people mm-hmm. that we work with, it's, they're just so easy to respect. We love them because they're so, so smart. And so, you know, um, I think working with these people is just so humbling a lot of the times too, because they're, they're not only nice and competent and great, but they're in, incredibly intelligent and mm-hmm. uh, really know their yeah. stuff in their zone of genius, right? Exactly. When it comes to marketing and websites, they're a little bit less genius. And I, similar with copywriting, that's why I love working with our clientele. It's like, they have this whole thing going on behind the scenes that they're not getting out into the world in a way that anyone gets, right? Like there's, it's a different language than they're used to speaking when we think about that outward communication. It's just, it's a different language. So why do you feel or know that it's important for new brands to have strong branding and a standout website. Why is that? Well, I mean, especially, so the brand is definitely one thing. It's kind of that, that magic that's a little bit hard to quantify. There's a little bit of kind of alchemy that goes into it. I always say in terms of just like when you see a good brand it, for a lot of, a lot of people, you just kind of feel it and you know it. Um, but a lot of that is based on a lot of strategic insights and building very specifically um, that with that in mind. But um, with websites, it's interesting because I think that the pandemic shifted so much that you used to be able to kind of get away with um, having a product that you could sell wholesale and to rely on foot traffic, or you could um, sell um, in a physical store, but that brought everything to a halt so fast. And with e-commerce, particularly, I think in the past, people kind of have put emphasis on making things look really sexy, but not necessarily conversion or data, um, which when it came down to the wire, <laughs> when everything shut down, people were seeing big losses there. And so we tried to work specifically to balance that, um, those needs of, of data and, um, aesthetics to make sure that it, like I said earlier, looks beautiful, but also works. And that's a a challenge, I think, to pull off. So it's also about testing and iterating in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. There's a big difference from an online business card that's like, I'm real, I'm legit, ta-da, here's my Squarespace three-page website. And then there's also the websites that are like lead generating machines and actually convert and capture and move the needle forward in your business. Yeah. So, Cause at the end of the day, you're running a business for sure. And your, your, your ultimate goal is to make money. <laughs> numbers so, matter. Numbers yeah. really matter. Yeah. So give us a few of the best practices for a website that does convert. What are some of your top tips for new brands or even existing brands to take a look at their web presence? Yeah, we, So there's a couple things that I see happen um, pretty frequently that I think people are are very quick wins, pretty frankly. Um, The first one is just um, making sure that you're thinking through your mobile experience. Most users these days are are mobile first. I mean, we've been hearing that kind of catch word for a long time, mobile first, mobile first. But what that means is really making sure that... um, you know, the, this, the experience is really optimized for mobile. I see some um, companies really cutting out content or re- like totally redoing content for mobile. And my feeling there is that if it's not important enough to say on desktop, then just don't say it at all. You know, I think 
you really need to lead with mo- mobile and make sure that you're telling your story in such a concise way and keeping in mind too that on mobile, you know, um, lots and lots of content adds to lots and lots of scrolling, which a lot of people might not do. So that's a very quick win. Um, another thing that I see in terms of being able to op- optimize um sites is just having a really clean navigation structure. It's something that like is easy, again, easy to say, but um, a lot of people kind of miss the mark on this just because they, they try to stuff a lot up in their top navigation. And really there, there's this principle about um, kind of consumer choice and overload. And really what you want people to do is to, to see, to really push people where you want them to go. So all you really need up in the top menu is maybe a shop and about page. Um, You don't need to link the blog in the top and all that because at the end of the day, it's just another item that they need to read and digest and think about, do I want to click there or not? And so a lot of that stuff, just really streamlining your navigation system will go a long way to really guide people to where you want them to go. Um, And then finally, one other thing that I see a lot on websites that really... um, uh, I think it helps a lot of brands if they think about it this way is I always like to say you need to optimize any site for the skimmers and the skeptics. So that means that in any given site, there are different types of people who will be consuming it. One's a skimmer. That's me. Um, <laughs> I scroll down really fast. I look at all the images. I maybe read a headline or two, but that's it. But for that type of person, what really matters is the feeling and the layout and how it looks And that's all I need to make a decision of whether or not I'm interested. The other bucket is the skeptics. So this would be like my husband. He reads every line of copy on a site. (laughs) I mean, for people who know him, I feel like they're probably laughing when they hear this, but it's very true. He reads every little thing and, you know, they're hunting for more information. So if you optimize your site for just the, the skimmers, you're missing out on revenue from the, from that skeptic user. So things that you can do to balance the need between both users is to hide things in kind of drop downs, expanded states. Nothing important should ever go in a drop down menu, but if it's kind of like secondary information, adding it into an expand and collapse or a pop up or something that's there, um, but only there if you want it, I think that's a really smart way to think about things. So it's about balancing how much content you have um, and making sure that all cases are considered. Yeah. Oh, great tips to really streamline and simplify. What I'm hearing is have like a clear goal for your website. Do you want them to go to your shop or read your blog? Like give them one option, right? A confused mind doesn't take action. So that clarity piece. And then also I love the idea of pop-ups and drop downs or additional pages that those uh, folks with all their due diligence can go and continue reading more. That is excellent. And as you were talking, I was hearing so many different elements between writing, web design, like graphic design. So you're not the only person running the show, I would assume. Can we shift gears for just a moment here and talk about your team? Mm -hmm. So when did you decide to have a team? Did you like talk? Because this is, I'm asking this because I'm really passionate about delegating for things that are outside of your zone of genius because Mm -hmm. it's helped me scale to get things that are off of my plate and really focus on the strategy and the places that I, I thrive. Mm -hmm. So what's your take on team building? (laughs) How, you know, who did you hire? I would say to, because these projects are big and require lots of geniuses from my experience. So what's your experience in team building? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good question. I, so for me, it's been a, it's been a a challenge. I think this is constantly, I think my hardest piece as a leader to come up against, because I I think every leader fights the urge to want to have to do everything or to do everything all by themselves. Right. And so to me, it just kind of, I never planned on like, I'm going to hire a team and scale up. It was just, I got to a point earlier on in my career with this, that I was just like, I I can't, I can't do this. We're getting so much, or I at the time, you know, was getting so many inquiries and um, just freaking out about it. It felt like a lot of work and it was just unmanageable at a certain point. So it kind of forced my hand in a good way to hire some designers. And so we're all design focused, but what I found that's really kind of the magic um, is that like, 
I thought for a while that I was the only person who could do design, right? But there are a lot of very talented designers out there. And so, especially with kind of oversight too, if they're younger or more junior, there's just, there's a lot of people that can do that job. But really what I, I, it took a step back and I said, what can I not delegate? And when it came down to it, it was just this type of thing. The one, one-on-one interactions, meeting new people, you know, um, getting to chat with founders, trying to figure out their roadmap, um, bigger picture items, and also just kind of business related items. Um, whereas I realized kind of, like I said, uh, by happenstance that at a certain point, um, I just had to give something up and, and the design um, is still something that you can really oversee and, and manage, but not have to be in there pushing pixels. Cause it's also a very time intensive yeah. process. <laughs> no, that's such a great point that we don't even realize that we have that belief that we're the only one, right? No one else can do this. I felt the same way with copywriting where it's like, that's my genius. Like there's no way that it, but there's a few things that you mentioned that I think are important for like coaches or other creatives who feel like I'm the only one, there's no duplicating me is get other experts, right? Like different styles, different types of people. This has been really helpful on our writing team because we have some writers who are moms and get that life experience and work really well with clients who are moms. And we have others who like live in their van and would never have a kid and they wouldn't be a good, you know, and it's like, fine, like allowing people to be their brilliance too in the team building process has given me so much relief of like, oh, I don't need like five mini Hannahs. I need a Nikki and a Lindsay and all these different types. Yeah. And when, it was interesting to me when I first offloaded um, the design aspect, it shocked me that um, in a good, in a very good way that when I handed it off to this younger designer that I brought on, she's incredibly bright, super smart, very talented, um, that her, I, you know, assigned her a project said, okay, here are the parameters, whatever. She came back with something that I just never would have thought of. Um, and that was such a pleasant surprise. And I just felt so relieved and so, um, just blown away by, the thinking. And it just dawned on me that like also having people that help you gives you another perspective on um, different approaches that you never would have thought of. And so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. she brings a lot to the table in that sense, especially from kind of a younger perspective. She's very on the cutting edge of what's new. Yeah. Oh, I could go on and on with you about the power of team and delegating Cause yeah. yeah, they like bring great ideas. And then you also have more space to think of great ideas for the business. You're not in the business all the time. You get to put your energy to thinking on the business, right? Like where are we going and being that visionary? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. Well, if listeners are thinking, Ooh, I need some clarity. I need like a rebirth or a relaunch with what I'm putting out there with my personal brand. How could people continue this conversation and, learn more about the work that you and your team do. Yeah. I mean, anybody can shoot me an email um, or check out our website. Um, I'm Kaylee at wildsdistrict.com and that's spelled W-I-L-D-E-S-D-I-S-T-R-I-C-T.com. It's kind of a difficult one to spell because there's a silent uh, E in there, I think. (laughs) But um, yeah, anybody can feel free to shoot me an email, just say hi and um just, yeah, feel free to reach out. And if there's anything I can do for your community or your audience, if there's people who just have any questions, let me know. I'd love to continue the conversation and keep, um, you know, meeting new people. And um, yeah, that connection, that feminine (laughs) energy, just making the dream work with um, all the teamwork today. So we will so appreciate, yeah, if you want to email Kaylee, otherwise you can check out wildsdistrict.com to learn more about what they're up to. And for listeners, I will see you. You won't, I don't know. We'll hang out again next week (laughs) with whatever senses you use to tune into this show with another inspiring guest that will help you make your dream life and business your reality. And don't forget to hop on over to dreamlifeisreallife.com slash show for specific goodies that we talked about today and access to continue the conversation with these guests as well as myself. I cannot wait to see what you create. Until next time.